Hey there, cats and kitties. I am the Blues Man, SXE Blues, and this podcast is going to be dealing with the Sherlockian side of my fandom, my fanboyish nature in all things Sherlock Holmes, my history of love with the character, love and interest, I should say. Um, now, where this all began, if we go from a chronological standpoint, which is kind of what I'm going to try to do here, it really begins when I was perusing the basement of my grandparents, and they had three Sherlock Holmes books. Two had no covers, and I didn't know at the time that two of them were, those two were uh, old printings. One was actually circa 1899, I think, uh, or 89, I'm not exactly sure, can't remember anymore. And the other one, which you'll see on the screen, uh, I think it was a reprinting sort of 1930s or maybe 1970s. I haven't actually flipped through it in a while. But I still have it. And the third book was a more modern one. I believe that one was like 80s-ish, uh, or maybe late 70s. And the cover featured a, a sort of mysterious silhouette of Sherlock Holmes. And it just, my imagination went wild by that picture. Um, now, jump ahead to Star Trek The Next Generation. There are like one or two episodes maybe three, where the characters Data and LaForge, respectively, are going on a holodeck adventure, and they want to relive some of the Sherlock Holmes adventures. These are really where my interest got into it, my knowledge of it began, because, you know, I'd just seen the cover of the book, I really didn't know anything. But uh, I did recognize the name Sherlock Holmes, the referenced name, and uh, they had this really cool actor who played Professor Moriarty, Daniel Davis, who you'll see on screen as well. Um, and I was really intrigued by the idea that, of course, at the time, I wasn't so much into Sherlock Holmes. It was a passing interest. And I was more intrigued by, oh my goodness, a character, a holodeck character could create its own intelligence to the point where it's become sentient. And how interesting that was. And wow, wouldn't that be fascinating to witness, unless he was destructive like Moriarty in the episode. But, and I'll reference some more ties to uh, the next generation, not specified to these particular episodes, um, a little bit later. But there was also references in Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country. Uh, the writer-director, Nicholas Meyer, who again is somebody I'll reference a little bit down the line, uh, was, you know, Sherlock Holmes fan, basically, and he put those little literary nods in some of Spock's dialogue. I think we see some of this in Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, as well, because he worked on that, but I can't remember. I remember more uh, vividly the lines of dialogue you hear in Star Trek VI. But that's where, like, the last of my interest was for a while. It was really, if we jump ahead, the... Matt Frewer films, uh, I think they were Hallmark Channel, like TV movies, and it was Matt Frewer and Kenneth Welsh as Holmes and Watson, respectively, and they did four movies, um, I don't remember what the fourth one was, or whichever one in the four of them that I'm going to not name, but there was The Hound of the Baskervilles, The Whitechapel Vampire, and The Royal Scandal, and this primarily because I'd been a fan of Matt for where I remember Max Headroom, uh, the commercials, not really the series. That's something I've always wanted to see. But uh, I remember him from the Max Headroom thing and, you know, funny movies like, uh, oh, I can't think of them, any other names right now. But you, if you're familiar with him, you get the gist. And so I saw these movies, and they were, the way they characterized Holmes in these movies was funny to me. And... So I began to be curious, because I didn't remember Holmes ever being referenced as being humorous. It was because, really, of this l little history that I've referenced up to this point of interest that I had. And then, spurred on by these films, I went out and I grabbed the first book that I showed you uh, from my grandparents' basement. I had grabbed the two of them, the one with the fancy cover got sold at a garage sale when they were moving from the north to Florida. One of the, one of the two books, as I say, was very old, and so I didn't want to 
you know, play around with it. The one that wasn't so old is actually the first one I ever read. And I forget how many stories are in it, not that many, maybe like five. Um, I believe it's A Study in Scarlet and then some of the uh, shorter stories. I might have that wrong. But uh, after reading that, I found a whole new world had opened up. And while I was perusing like Barnes and Noble or Books a Million, uh, I came across this big tome, which you will see on the screen, that boasts the entire Sherlock Holmes canon as written by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. So I thought, I have to have this. I bought it, and I've since read it cover to cover twice. With And, and I've said this previously in a previous podcast, with a few favorite stories, uh, you know, I've gone back to read over and over again. My top three favorites of the short stories, if I were to list them, and uh, these are my top three recommendations, would have to be The Speckled Band, uh, The Copper Beaches, and The Dancing Men. So if you ever have an interest in Sherlock Holmes' stories, the original written short stories, go check those out before you check any other ones out. Because um, they they just really, the way they were written, the sort of action-adventure, the pacing, the the intrigue, the on the edge of your seatness about them, uh, just it it translates off the page crazily well, um, you know. So moving on after the Matthew films and after beginning to read, they there was a couple TV movies that had tried to uh, you know cash in on the Sherlock Holmes thing, and I thought they were actually pretty good movies. There was Sherlock Case of Evil with James Darcy as Holmes and Vincent D'Onofrio as Moriarty, which I thought was really wicked cool casting. Um, The tie in that movie to, uh, you know, how Holmes becomes the addict he becomes and how it all ties to Moriarty. And there's a thing about, you know, he was injected on the arm and it's the, if you trace the line of the injections, uh, you know, it's an M, and he figures out it's Moriarty. It was just really cool. And then there was uh, the case of the silk stocking. This had Rupert Everett and Ian Hart as Holmes and Watson, I believe. And his portrayal of Holmes, I always felt was kind of like in the vein of the Grenada TV series, which had Jeremy Brett as Holmes. And there were two actors in that that had uh, played Watson. There was David Burke and Edward Hardwick. I'm not sure if that's the order in which they were, if it's the other way around, but uh, I was able to see some of the episodes of that out of curiosity for a little while I had owned the DVDs, and it was a very good series, Uh, almost ripped directly from the page as far as how they adapted it. They didn't, you know, take too many liberties. They tried to stay as true to it as possible. Probably the most faithful uh, on-screen adaptations you will ever see. And my sister and I got really into those. Um, There is another book that I picked up uh, called The Exploits of Sherlock Holmes, which you'll see the cover of. And this is particularly cool because it takes references to unsolved cases from the original canon. And it's either uh, Conan Doyle's son or grandson, Adrian Conan Doyle, who co-writes these adventures. And for that alone, you know, I picked it up, and I remember enjoying it. And also I grabbed the Bedside Bathtub Armchair Companion by Dick Riley and Pam McAllister. Uh, The the cool thing about this is, if you've read the stories, and even if you haven't read the stories, it kind of gives you an idea of what the stories were about, the the overarching themes. It gives you funny little quotes, it gives you inconsistencies, gives you an idea of what London was like at the time, uh, as well as how it differed from the story to reality and things of that sort. Just really cool for little, you know, nods like that here and there. If we jump back, though, I said earlier there was going to be a tie to The Next Generation, and the Grenada TV series with Jeremy Brett actually featured Marina Sirtis, who played Counselor Troy on The Next Generation, in an episode, I believe it was the Six Napoleons, and you know, which involved 
uh, six little, whatever you call them, like mock-ups of Napoleon, little statues or something to that effect. I don't exactly remember in all detail, but I just thought it was a funny little footnote. And But here's another interesting thing. Nicholas Meyer, who I referenced, uh, had worked on Star Trek 2 and 6, respectively. He went on to read, uh, not read, he went on to write three Sherlock Holmes books, which I think are phenomenally good. Uh, there's the 7% Solution, and there was a movie version of that, which was really good. Uh, I always thought it was funny and interesting. Alan Arkin uh, is in it, and I forget who else, uh, Robert Duvall, I believe. And you'll see images on screen to that effect. But his three books were 7% Solution, West End Horror, and The Canary Trainer. And each of these is somewhat influenced in that, uh, like in one of them, Holmes meets Bram Stoker. Uh, in another one, he meets uh, somebody whose name I can't remember off the top of my head. But if you look into these books, these are highly recommended. I mean... I know other writers have tried to tackle the world of Sherlock Holmes, that whole canon, and I think it's arguable whether they do it effectively or not. Nicholas Meyer nails it, 100%. And as I say, I saw the movie version of The 7% Solution, and that was pretty cool. So, um, the, the last real big thing that I can talk about is uh, the more recent Sherlock Holmes movie series, I guess you could say, since there's a sequel coming with Robert Downey Jr. and Jude Law. Now, I didn't see this until many months after it came out. I bought it on DVD or Blu-ray or whatever it was. And uh, it, it must have been Blu-ray because I can't watch it anymore since my PS3 got befuddled. But uh, this was a pretty good movie, I thought. Um, certain elements stayed true to the character, enough of them that it kept me interested and in not really complaining and uh, some of the, you know, ways they filmed it and some of the aspects that they had I thought were really cool. I liked big time the shift from uh, the sort of bumbling, you know, tag along that Watson most often is uh, and always, you know, belittled sort of by Holmes. Depending on what version of Holmes you'll watch. Usually, he, he's just, you know, he's just there in the background. But in this particular movie, it was Jude Law right there toe-to-toe -to -toe with Holmes, uh, and occasionally a couple steps ahead of him. So, th I thought this was very interesting, and a cool take on it, uh, the you know, that whole relationship. And, of course, you know, there is a new uh, series over in the U.K., and on BBC America, I think. I'm not exactly sure. Haven't seen anything about that uh, other than at the time of this recording, the uh, purported problems with trying to get full series of Doctor Who and how that series may be in conflict with uh, that goal being reached and so forth. But, you know, this is about as close to a nutshell as I can get with my uh, history and love, my Sherlockian fandom, if you will, uh, my history and love with the character of Sherlock Holmes, and that whole world. And, you know, the inspiration for this came from a couple of conversations with uh, subscribers of mine through comments and things of that sort. Um, one is equally a Sherlockian fan, as well as uh, the other who is sort of, has always been curious and uh, wanted to get an idea of, you know, what it's all about type of thing. And so, this is really just what I wanted to do. I wanted to kind of give you a nutshell view of my history with it, my familiarity with it, and uh, why I dig it so much. What kind of things can you check out if you're curious and you haven't before? Or maybe if you have, you know, you'll agree with me or disagree with me on what your favorite story is or whether or not you've seen a movie and if you thought it was good. You know, let me know these things in the comments. Let me know what you think. Um... If you're familiar with it, if you're interested. And, uh, you know, so that's pretty much it on the whole Sherlock Holmes canon thing. Uh, thank you, as always, for watching. And leave me comments, video responses, anytime you wish, on anything you wish. And, uh, you know, maybe we can continue boogieing in the future. So, for now, this is SXE Blues, signing off.